All right, we're live again here at Buffalo Trace Distillery for another episode of Whiskey Wednesday. And we have Lee and Nick with us, and we're in Bourbon Pompeii. Lee, let's talk about it. Thanks. Now, welcome to uh, Buffalo Trace. Welcome to Bourbon Pompeii. Uh, this is a very unique historical site. Uh, there's nothing else like this in the entire industry. Just a little bit of history. Um, in addition to being the oldest continuously operating distillery in the country, uh, we have some of the oldest distillery facilities still standing. Um, go back in history, E.H. Taylor Jr. Uh, was uh, a banker prior to the Civil War. And uh, after the Civil War, he decided to get into the distilling industry directly. So um, he'd spent a year touring Europe. He came back about 1869, found a little distillery for sale down on the banks of the Kentucky River here in Lee's Town. Uh, he bought that in 1869, named it OFC for Old Fire Copper. He had these big ideas he was going to put into action about making a fine whiskey. Um, well, that little distillery wasn't nearly big enough for his ambitions. So after a couple of years, he tore that down and built literally on top of it uh, in 1874, one of the finest, grandest distilleries of its day. And that's where he really began to make a name for himself in that OFC bourbon. Well, unfortunately, uh, that distillery was struck by lightning and burned to the ground in 1882. In less than a year, uh, Taylor rebuilt in the building that we're actually standing in right now, which literally was the biggest distillery of its day. He was really working to bring the industrial revolution to the distilling industry, uh, steam power and things like that. Well, over time, the distillery grew, and after Prohibition, uh, Albert Blanton had built a brand new distillery, which means this old distillery was essentially obsolete. So they made most of the distillery into the steam plant. And to this day, uh, this old OFC distillery is where we generate all the steam to run the stills and the cookers and everything else. But the back part of this building, which had been E.H. Taylor's fermenting and, and uh, mashing area, um, was essentially vacant. Well, in the big consolidation in the industry after Prohibition, uh, this distillery was owned by Shinley, which also happened to own another label called George Dickel. Well, George Dickel's a Tennessee whiskey, and Tennessee stayed dry after Prohibition. So from sometime after Prohibition, about 1959, when Dickel got to go home, they actually were making George Dickel Cascade whiskey right here in this area. Well, when Dickel left, we were going full bore down at the new distillery. We really didn't need this. So anything that wasn't bolted down, they took out. Anything that was built in, they essentially knocked it down and poured a big concrete floor over it and forgot about it. Until about four years ago, we saw an opportunity in here. Uh, thought we'd make some uh, event space. We got a big space upstairs, windows overlooking the Kentucky River down here. This was just that big open concrete floor. But we wanted to make sure everything was sound, uh, that the, it's not going to slide off into the river. So they were going to check the foundation. They were going to dig up that concrete floor. Well, they started digging and almost immediately ran into some structures, some things. And we, uh, we, we'd had a relationship with this uh, a bourbon archaeologist. Um, yeah, in Kentucky, that's, that's actually a job title. Um, and so we'd worked with Nick before on another uh, project. And so when they made this discovery, uh, we called in Nick Quinta, our bourbon archaeologist, to really lead a dig um, that revealed what we now like to call bourbon Pompeii. So I'm going to turn it over to Nick and let him tell you all about that discovery and, and what we found. Nick? All right. Thanks a lot, Lee. All right, so whenever I got the call, I was just like, hey, Nick, come and visit us. We're doing a renovation, and we found something old. That was all I had. So if you look over here, this was all mostly concrete floor on this side. There was a big bobcat sitting up here where the catwalk is now, and this was just a large dirt pit in front of us. And there's a few things exposed, but uh, we're like, the question is, what is it? You got a weekend. We got a project. We want to stay on schedule. You got Saturday, Sunday. It was the best weekend of my life, I can tell you that. I got to get down here and play in the dirt. And what I was looking for was layers. Uh, I was trying to interpret the dirt as far as like layers of a storybook, right? In archaeology, we call it stratigraphy. We have an idea of how old something is. And so we're finding like gigantic deposits of brick. And over here between this pillar and the, the kind of uh, broken pier here, there's a whole bunch of glass in that area. At the end of the weekend, I um, came over, I presented to the team, I was like, all right, so we got, um, this is what's going on with the dirt, we got uh, some older artifacts over in this area, and you can actually see the brick walls from the, uh, the fermenting vats right there, and it was like a, uh, a record scratch, right, everybody's like, wait, 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 hold on, fermenting vats, say it again, 
and that's where the project changed. It was, uh, what, year, year and a half, it felt like, uh, where it was like our instructions were dig to China, uncover everything. Over here, it meant uncovering the fermenting vats, but we'll get back to that in a little bit. Over here, it meant uncovering these things and trying to figure out where it fit in the story that Lee just told, right? Where it is in the history. So we left these piers in this area intact because they're here, they're old, we're not entirely sure which part of the history they belong to, right? But it makes for good speculation. If you look above us here, this beam where they're making a repair in the roof at one point, we think that some of these piers in the bottom might have been to take the stress off of the roof while they're making repairs like that. Because these distilleries, especially here at Buffalo Trace, it's like a living, breathing organism. You can see the history literally in the walls as you walk around, right? All right, so over here a little bit. And Nick, I was I was just looking at these things. So, what was what was here? What was the first sign of the of a discovery or a first sign of that this was something special? You touched on it, and I want to understand like, is this normal in the industry? Is this something that you've come upon? often or is this something that's really unique or <laughs> no so when i was looking at industrial distilleries right when i started doing bourbon archaeology right with these 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 businesses it's all about making the highest quality whiskey as much of it as you can and getting out to market right so you don't take risk in that if you're building a large building like this all of the the weight and the value of the product that's going in here you don't want to leave anything to chance and when you're constructing things that means you wipe everything away you get down to a good solid foundation that's clean and stable and you build clean on top of it right so usually when you see a new construction project of this size none of this is left down here at all uh, you might find a rock here and there an artifact here and there but you're not going to find the bits and pieces of foundation one of the reasons that it happened here is we're literally right on the side of the Kentucky River. You can see it out the windows there. Uh, when the Kentucky River is high enough, it actually comes into this building every now and then, right? And we're also on a big slope. The ground surface is actually up there. Way up there. So, what's going on here is in the first stage of this distillery, they got the foundation right and then they had to reconstruct in a hurry, right? Uh, the 1873 version of this, whenever it got struck by lightning and burnt in a year, they rebuilt inside of a year and they wanted to do it quickly. So they left these bits and pieces of the foundation, the wow. things that were already stable, and it is pretty much a unique discovery. I have not seen anything else like this in industrial excavations here in Kentucky. Right. So it, it doesn't mean I'm not going to keep looking. There might be more, right? You want to see what else we found over here? Sure. And illustrate it a little bit. So I'd actually started over there in the actual excavation and we kind of filled in the pieces as we came forward. But we started comparing the archaeology, the, the artifacts, the features, these foundations with the lithographs. I mean, <laughs> Colonel Taylor actually left us. This is exactly what I did. He had these lithographs commissioned advertising the history of this distillery. There's not really any embellishment no smoke and mirrors in what he was doing because he was proud of his work and he was also trying to talk about like authenticity in the industry kind of the the precursor to his work a little later on with like bottled and bond and whatnot right so this picture here we've got circled where the door is of that very first stage of the distillery what what colonel taylor found whenever he came here it wasn't big enough for him so he wanted to go bigger better he ripped us down made a new distillery on top of it by comparing everything and looking at how the soil layers are intersecting each other, the foundations are intersecting each other, we realized that this wall right below us right here is actually a part of that 1869 distillery. We found door hardware in the little gap down there. And so when you stand in that space, you're standing literally where that doorway is in that lithograph, 1869. I get like chills just thinking about it. It's, it's kind of rare that somebody leaves instructions it's like this is what you're finding right it's one of the things that makes this special so some other bits here this concrete piece here is actually one of the uh closest to the present elements of the distillery um it's 1910s at some point it's a trough support because at one time everything that we've walked past had a slop cooling trough that went over to the drop tub there 
And it's a little ironic, as even though it's the closest to the present, we know the least about that part of the distillery. So, uh, about the phase of this building. So, this is the second distillery. OFC, 1873. So, he ripped down that first one, he built this. So, this corner that I'm looking at with the sign, 17, or 1873, would be the face of this distillery in this in this right. graph here so we're standing right here yep. looking that way and you got the first few courses here you can see that detail in the corner down there and it's a lot of fun looking at this because at first before we dug deep enough to get that corner we're looking at it and you can see how finely chiseled the raised mortar joints all of that we've all seen it if you've been at buffalo trace before there's another construction like this it's warehouse c right built about the same time you can see that kind of same characteristic to it so we knew we had an exterior wall we can look at the other side as we walk by you see it's not really finished we just didn't know how old it was right. until we got that deep and we saw the lithograph and we're like again colonel taylor left us some clues as far as what's going on here you know it's funny it's not like it's not documented in the same way we would document something today but you're right there's a lot of little clues and I think with all the hard work that you guys did, you start to unearth something really special. Oh, for sure. And then there's lots of little uh, fun details, right? You see the twist in this pier down here? We like to joke that that was somebody's first day on the job. They're like, all right, here, go on and lay some brick. And he laid it in the wrong direction and wow. got reassigned to somewhere, somewhere else, right? Oh, wow. So this, the, these columns, Yeah. these were definitely something that you started noticing early on right the columns are starting to stick out you found something um, that these these are sitting on these big beams and then where did you start I'm curious where did you start which end of the room and did I you started work? right here where I'm standing okay. right now oh, okay. so there was a bobcat where you are yeah and there was a ladder going down into the pit here and I climbed down and from here to the the concrete floor that we installed below us here was just soil and you could see just layers uh you could see where the flood deposits where the the river had come in and left like really thick deposits of uh sand right nothing in them but between those flood deposits there was a little bit of brick some old nail things like that and it's just like a storybook right but written in soil instead of on paper and then the fun thing if you think about it, whenever you're building this column, whenever you're building the fermenting vats here, you could actually see construction trenches where somebody dug down through all those layers it was clear as day, and they dug down to the base of this pier, down to that. And that's what let us know that these things here um, were constructed before the layers or after the layers in the soil, right? And that's one of the ways, it's like a big uh, logic puzzle, figuring out what came before the other pieces. You know, something that you brought up, uh, the concrete floor. So we did have a couple questions about what, you know, on the phone, it's, it is hard to see some of these details, but you didn't just dig down to this concrete floor. This concrete floor was installed after right. this is new and right. why, why the concrete floor at this point yeah so what we dug down to is uh we call it subsoil there is no artifacts there no trace of human activity at all in the case of this room it was all just kind of fine soft river sand okay so the reason for the concrete floor is that just like historically this room is going to flood and it'll flood several times most likely um, so whenever it does flood, those windows are going to open, the river's going to come in, and eventually it'll go back out. It'll make it a lot easier to clean. It's, I'm not sure if you can see it on the phone, but there's actually holes, like drain holes, drilled in the exterior wall yeah. and drilled into the fermenting vats in gotcha. order to promote that water going out. Yeah, so modern day, this is not flood proof. If we're still on the river. We're still, you know, have a lot of natural. Right. Uh, you can come by in the uh, the winter time, especially when the, the river's up just a little bit. You can't see the lock and dam um, that's up the river there, but the water will actually start coming in these drain holes every now and then. Gotcha. It's fascinating. Has it flooded since we, since uh, this progress? It's only been what an inch or so. Lee? Well, we've had a little bit more. We had a little bit more than that. There was uh, maybe. Two and a half feet of water, foot and a half of water, something like that. What a year ago, February, I think. Okay. Um, but it was very minor. It didn't. That really didn't amount to anything. Okay. Right. Awesome.
And I did notice there's there's marks on the wall over there, so maybe we can show that off. Of that that must there. be years on of flooding. So right, we'll get to that. We'll All right, that. there's a lot to see here. That's for sure. So after this burns down, the next stage, the third stage of what we're looking at here is everything is built around us, right? And that was one of the, the kind of shocking things to wrap our head around. It's like, all right, everything was built around us. There's a lithograph over there. It's actually this room. And you could see the fermenting vats actually being used, right? So one of the fun things I like to talk about here is we knew the vats were here. We weren't entirely sure what was going on with them at first, right? We did a little, um, a little square with a concrete saw. And um, whenever the construction guys finished cutting it, it just kind of fell away into darkness. And the guys looked at me and they're like, you want to go down there? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we ended up taking our time, pulling everything back. And like Lee was saying, whenever Shinley decided to decommission, this is not being used anymore. The copper is still valuable. So if you look at the one that was reconstructed here, where the red brick is there on the top few courses, everything was ripped off at about that height. It was just kind of hammered out with sledgehammers. It was dumped into the uh, fermenting vats in order to fill everything. There was random dirt taken yeah. from around the distillery and thrown in there as well. And as the water kind of made it settle, we had a, a good like two, three foot void above all of that that was just underneath the concrete floor. The fascinating thing though with this is that there were still strips of copper inside. There was bits and pieces because if you can imagine this thing, 14,000 gallons lined with copper sheeting like a big copper bathtub, right? And actually right over there, you can see a little bit of tooth in the mortar. And Taylor actually describes it. He's like, I'm taking some Portland cement, some other, uh, other types of mortar here. And what I'm doing is I'm sealing the brick that's on the outside of these things and I'm putting the other cement on the inside of the copper sheeting you add a little bit of tooth here just like if you have done a backsplash at your your kitchen counter or something like that yeah. and kind of glue it together into a very shiny copper fermenting vat copper lined fermenting vat yeah I see the texture you're talking about I'm oh yeah as close as I can but you can see there's just a little bit of tooth in that concrete wall that, yeah. That basically gives a texture to adhere to. That's exactly. I can see that. So we have Taylor's words and what he's doing, and we have the actual artifacts, the pieces of the copper, the little fingerprints that he's left behind for us, and then the the question ultimately came: is like, all right, we've finished excavating. What do we do with this? It's a unique find. There's nothing else like it in the industry, right? And the idea was thrown out. Let's throw some catwalks over top of it. Leave right. it all open and you know open it for tours yeah then buffalo trace went that extra step and they're like let's go on and rebuild this thing let's reactivate it before and, we get to that yeah. presentation thing matthew does say be sure to show us the view of the river out back oh so, let's go let's yeah. go and look at the river all right it's worth going to for sure and and i think it's that's what's fascinating something this large it's it, it's built right on the side of the river I mean, right it's, and it's still used today and there's still a little bit to find. Like we're standing on top of an unexcavated vat because there were um, eight in total going this way. And there were, I'm standing on, I believe three, and there were two more going that way. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and uh, Lee, you may be, is this, this is the main water source from, from the river, isn't it? This giant pipe? Correct. We are drawing water from the river. We use it for cool, not in the product itself. We use it for cooling and things like that. And there's a sluice gate right down on the river where we're drawing river water in through this and you might hear occasionally a big clunking noise that's the pumps turning on to bring that water in straight out of the river yeah i think that's pretty cool yeah it's giant okay and there's the man himself yeah yes, right. taylor you can tell how happy he is everybody's here <laughs> about as happy as he ever got he was uh, quite the curmudgeon they say <laughs> well it's just fascinating yeah I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the river view too oh, sure. uh, it's always great uh, uh, you can see here, uh, this is what I was talking about a minute ago, where you could actually see how this room functioned, right? This lithograph, we're standing more or less right here, looking in that direction, and you could see where he actually had the fermentation tanks labeled. So when we refer to like VAT 7, VAT 6, it's actually how he had it laid out. So I'm curious, uh, on, on this drawing, where would the, the height of the catwalks be? Would it be where this man is standing or would it be as high as this green wall? We think it's gonna be right about here. Okay. 
so there was just a little bit of change uh, over time. I've seen a, a picture from early 1900s where the, the actual slate floor was built up to be just about even with the tops of these, right? And uh, we could look at it a little bit later, but we actually found one of the copper uh, spigots, uh, like a valve that was inside this piping here. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. And this is behind what Taylor's idea was, right? I mean, the other distilleries at the time that he was here, he was talking about wood slat floors. You got liquids falling in, soaking into the ground underneath. He called it like really sour, unsanitary conditions, right? And here you can see he's concentrating on, we're cleaning up the slate floor here. We got sunlight coming in. Everything's super sterile, super clean, highest quality whiskey made at the time. And he goes another step further. He's like, it's going to touch nothing but copper from beginning to end hence the uh, copper lined vats yep. and you know I noticed this structure is a little different are do you plan on talking about this is this the cistern or is this what is this so this is uh, the drop tub and um, this is uh, again for that um, latest stage of the distillery sometime in the 1900s but it's kind of fun um, I talked about the distillery being kind of a living entity, right? You can actually see the 1873 wall going down the middle where they decided oh. they needed the function of this drop tub. They dug a hole through all the artifacts just like we did four or five years ago and they just plastered around. It's a single course of brick and plaster built around that element of the past there, right? And why wouldn't they have just knocked down that little wall? That takes a little bit more effort, and you already have that um, that stability in the foundation, right? Got it. We think one of the ways that this functioned, you can see the hole in the wall over here, is that there was a, a metal uh, tank down inside, and whenever the slop came off the slop, um, the slop troughs fell into here, that water was piped in, and it helped bring everything down to temperature before adding malt or something like that. But it's another fun, I mean... Yes, we excavated everything, but there's still tons, tons to learn here. Sure. All right. Check out the river. All right. And on our way out, you should uh, look at this picture here, Tim. This is uh, one of the only photos that exist of uh, what this building looked like before the project. It was so nondescript that we actually had a trouble finding photos of the nondescript room. So this, yeah, wow. Right. Yeah, so you can tell in this photo, this is, everything's just covered. It's concrete over, it's just another room at this point. And then you start digging right beneath this concrete floor, and that's what we just saw. That's what's so amazing. Oh, yeah. It's a good before and after, for sure. All that's right. Good. A little windy today. Oh, goodness. All right. Yeah, so you can see why they built this distillery, where they built it, right on the river. For sure. You can see the lock of dam up there. And you actually see uh, what's on the image right now. You can see that bulge in the uh, the brick up there. And that was one of the places where the uh, the wall was starting to subside. It's one of the reasons that we started with the repointing and digging down and redoing the border and all the foundation here. We might have a little, we're cutting out just a little bit on right the sound but it's a lock and dam just up river here and they were dealing with that historically too as you can see the buttresses that are built in supporting the side of uh, the building here and uh, whenever you look at the lithographs you can actually see one buttress 10 20 years later another one's added wow. so it's not a new problem that we're dealing yeah. with here and you, you earlier you were pointing out the, the um, the natural spring to me oh yeah we can and you can see, see it. it the river's uh, cooperating today so that is a constant character in the story of this place it shows up in all the lithographs they have kind of different constructions around it the fanciest is the kind of the curved uh, pool that's in front of it right and we'll look at the lithograph of that earlier but you can still see tiny elements of that still remain yep all right Thanks, Lee. All right, so we, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty windy out there. Sorry for the sound interruption there. All right, so we, here's another angle of this, and then we're going to take you around to see the fer fermentation tank. Oh yeah, we're going to hear about that from Lee, right? Yeah. 
so yeah you can see the twisted column down there but there's recycled building underneath us here so the 1873 after it burnt down it got um the the stone got salvaged and reused and so these piers these foundations that are up against this exterior wall here I learned a lot about this from the construction guys. Those are supposed to be flush with that outside wall. The building is built in a way that them being in touch with the outside wall, it puts like stress and diverts it into the building. And you're not supposed to be able to fit in between uh, that and the, the backing wall. So you can see how much the, um, the wall was in trouble. And um, yeah, you can, yeah, you can visually see that wall pushing out. Wow, okay. Very cool, Nick. It's kind of fun getting uh, tours from the, the engineering folks that uh, were involved with this too, right? Because it's like the, the way the catwalks are uh, lodged into the walls, right? They actually replaced the volume of dirt that we took out of this. The catwalk system is actually kind of pulling it all together. So there's, there's different levels here of, of yeah. coolness, right? All right. You want to walk this way, or let's look at the uh, flood lines. I noticed those lines, and uh, we've had several questions about how much will this place flood, and how how often, and and what's the most most it's ever flooded. So oh boy. So well, here's the uh, the flood lines here, and you can see them on the column there behind you, and there too. Yeah. yeah let's check this out. Yeah, I always like to say that uh, you know being right on the river. It's not really a matter of when, it's only a matter of if, not a if, it's only a matter of when the river's going to come back. So these are some of the historic floods over the years. Uh, it was built in 1883. Taylor had just had a fire in 82 that destroyed his distillery. He's building back as hard as he can in 1883. He gets hit with the biggest flood of the 19th century. Wow, that's a good point. Uh, you go on up to 1937. That's the flood everybody talked about when I was growing up here in Frankfurt. Um, Albert Blanton was building out after Prohibition. He gets hit with the biggest flood of the 20th century to that point. Oh, gotcha. We're in our 21st century expansion. I don't want to think about what's going to yeah, happen this time. Because that 37 flood is considered a 500-year flood. Statistically, you shouldn't see a flood that severe except for 500 years. Well, it was 41 years, and that was topped in 1978. Got it. And hey. so from here, a level line all the way out to the front part of the distillery, the parking lot at the lowest point was under about three and a half, four feet of water, wow. all the way out across the entire distillery. Gosh. So we, we may have had a little technical glitch there. Uh, so if anybody saw that, we're back. <laughs> but it did skip a beat there for a second, but we're back on. So, okay. All right, so let's check out the fermentation tanks. And as we uh, walk over there, we do have a few questions from our viewers. Uh, Jan asked Lee, where is this exactly on the property? So she, if she has visited, mm -hmm. um, and she's here again. I know, yeah, on the river, but if yeah. you're in the parking lot or the gift shop. This is, this is what we call the backside of the distillery. Okay. And so it really is when you're coming in the distillery, you come out of the parking lot, you just keep walking straight all the way back to the back part of the distillery. That's where, where we are now. Yeah, it's something you can't really see. From no, you really, can't, you, you really can't see it from anywhere else on the distillery unless you're, you're coming back here. And is this part of a current tour? That yes, our, our old Taylor tour comes back here. That's okay. why we built all of these catwalks and why we preserved everything and got all the wonderful information from Nick that we now incorporate into our old Taylor tour. Great where we're focusing on the, the life and times of E.H. Of e. Taylor, yeah. that, uh, the, the, really the father of the modern bourbon industry. Yeah, so great. when we, we got these excavated and got them all uncovered, we realized they're still in really good shape. Right. And so we figured, oh, well, we can do something with this. So uh, we hired Vendome out of Louisville. Well, we bought some rolled copper from Germany. Hired Vendome, who's the leading steel manufacturer and copper fabricator probably in the world. They fabricated a pan, not nearly 14,000 gallons, but to fit inside of this fermenter, and we are now fermenting in a copper-lined fermenter, just like E.H. Taylor did in the That's 1880s. Awesome. That's uh, well, what's nice is now it doesn't just smell like an excavation site. It's got <laughs> exactly. a little mash in there yeah. now, so it's nice. Well, and just to bring this back to life after all these That's years. Right. And That's nobody right. is fermenting in copper yeah. anywhere in the industry so this is is very very unique well it's interesting because it, it it also answers a question from ryan on facebook he says any plans to restore them and use them again so i think we answered his question yeah and and this really is it's a demonstration project it's not going to be anything that we're going to line all the rest of them in copper and make a a new product out of it but we are fermenting we are distilling we are aging and so 
there will be something that will be coming out of this eventually. Yeah, and that, that ain't, well, you answered another question <laughs> of mine, Lee, from Ralph. He says, uh, is the mash in the copper tank for a heritage blend or, or a future release? Yeah, and it will be. We don't have any specifics or details. We've just been doing this for a couple of years, so it's got a good bit of aging to go before anything will be ready for market. Yeah, so, yeah, I guess always keep your eye out. You know, keep you your eyes know. open, that's right. You never know. Hey, we've had some questions about some of the details in the discovery. You know, you've mentioned glass, you've mentioned copper strips. I noticed there's some glass cases up there. I'd love to show that. Uh, let's right. show that and then we'll probably wrap up there. Is All that right, good? let's go. Is that good for both of you? Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. All right. So it's a little ironic, uh, really, that this is a warehouse sized room. It was a year of excavation here, but um, there wasn't a lot of artifacts. There was a whole lot of brick, but uh, not a lot of like pieces of plates or bones or anything like that. I know I saw a question about uh, were any bones of any kind discovered during the excavation and really there was just um, just one. We found a little place, uh, this one right here, and if you uh, were able to see the other side you could actually see like gnaw marks where a dog had taken it down in there and, uh, oh, wow. and, and had a meal uh, probably in the early, uh, it was like in the earlier deposits, but you could see a little bit of uh, a little 13 on the bottom of a glass uh, bottle there. Uh -huh. um, a little bit of plates for somebody was having a meal or something. Again, probably for some of the earlier stages of the distillery. And then a lot of this other stuff, big copper ring, the copper spigot I mentioned earlier. A lot of this is from the different pipes and tubing and whatnot that were all across the distillery throughout its life. Um, one of the more interesting things to me is uh, some of this brick's really old, right? You can actually see this is a handmade brick. You actually have the fingerprints in there. That's really neat. Isn't it? Yeah, it is. And so this is another layer of, of the room, but this would have been much later in history. But I, what I want to show is the, is the mural up here to kind of give us an idea of what this, what this looked like and where we are. And, and what are we looking at here, Lee? This is another page from the uh, lithograph book that Taylor put out as promotional materials. Shows the distillery as it was about 1886. So uh, we're on the diagonal, the upper right-hand side along the river there. Like, up, yeah, up, so up see the fountain, fountain in the middle. Go straight up from the fountain in the middle. Yep. That low, flat-roofed building is where we are right now. Yeah, it's tough to see. But yeah, there it is. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, diagonally down from that, there's a building with a tower on it. Uh, that was that 1883 distillery that's now the steam plant, so it's been radically changed since then. The fountain is where uh, our 1940s bottling hall was constructed, which is now our new fermenting room. And then just to the left of that, there's a building that's marked OFC 113B. That's our visitor center today. Yep. Wow. And then just across from that is OFC 113C. That's the famous warehouse C, uh, built in 1885. That warehouse is still in use. So there are a number of these buildings that are still standing, a number of have been lost, yeah. but uh, the uh, Warehouse C is really the only one that's still being used in its original intended purpose from right. 1885. That's great. Well, you know, I know we're, we're wrapping up on time here, but I, I'm always fascinated by some of the barrels, uh, some of the copper strips and the bricks. Um, what do we have here, Nick? This is some of the copper strips that uh, came out of the actual fermenting vats. You can see a little bit of detail here about how these things are uh, connected to each other. There was a piece that we found that actually had like a, a channel bolt on top to where we knew that this say this is the very top of the, the copper um, fermenting yeah. vat goes down inside and there's a large bolt that goes down into the brick in order to hold everything together in addition to the little bits of mortar and whatnot that you still see traces on here. That's great. Well, I'll tell you what, that's, that's a heck of a tour. I know we could do this three or four more times for <laughs> sure. Um, and so maybe we'll continue this next year. We're gonna do Whiskey Wednesdays in, in 2021, so I'm sure we'll have both of you back to do it. Any last words and anything you wanna close with? Oh, I'm just having a fantastic time. It's like giving a tour, but we also get to poke around Pompeii. I'm all about it. Thanks yeah. for having me out. Absolutely. Yeah. And we really look forward to seeing everybody uh, coming to visit us here. But the uh, main thing is we want everybody to stay well. Stay healthy and uh, have a happy holidays That's and uh, come out and see us.
Great. Thanks. Thanks, both of you. That's Cheers. amazing. Yep. Cheers. I'm going to go back over here and check out this fermentation. This is a better, this is a good angle. <laughs>